Greetings! Welcome to the devlog for hot dogs, horseshoes, and hand grenades. We're going to start off as always with a quick sound check. Make sure your speakers aren't up too high. So what have we got for you this week? Well, we have continued door adventures. And so where to start? Where to start? Well, let's start with the futzy things and then get to the more uh, explosive things. The big addition this week uh, is, aside from a whole bunch of code refactors that happen so that I can eventually make a, uh, a right-handed version of this door, uh, is a key system, uh, which required uh, a whole bunch of clever engineering as I ran into a, uh, a bunch of unique challenges. So as you can see here, we've got a we've got a key and it's got a little tag on it. Uh, and this is these are actual real physics joints. If we take our testing gun and push it against here, you can see this actually all fully collides and such, which is fun to play with. Um, but this presents a bunch of problems when it comes to doing something like actually putting a key in an object. Uh, the reason for that just has to do with the way that joints work in a physics engine and mass relationships. Basically, this door is like somewhere between like a hundred and a thousand times the mass of this key. So if I attempted to actually joint the key to the door and then move the door around, you'd basically see it rubber banding all over the place. It would not be fun. You can even see that just a little bit if I wave this really, really hard, you can see because the amount of force involved, the ring is actually detaching from the key in flight. And that's just, you know, physics engine. So there is an entirely separate copy of the key essentially in the lock that is turned off that functions via a completely different set of rules. So we insert this here, and now we have a proxy key. You can see it still has some physics inertia there in terms of moving it forward and back, rotating it and such, but this is not jointed, and as you can see, it isn't colliding with anything because it's it, this is basically functioning the same way that the uh, wibbly bits on some firearms function. So, so we can now, we should, oh, we should be able to open, ah, is it getting stuck? Sorry about that, mild technical difficulties. Something is going on. I changed something about my door uh, latch collider and now it is being a little bit cantankerous. So I will have to tune that later. But anyway, let's kind of, where were we? Oh yes, uh, as you can see, the actual door hardware has been replaced with something a little smoother and more high poly. The doorknob feels a little more correct in terms of its, uh, its height. Let's go like that. Let's open it and see if the door actually wants to behave. There we go. So the way this should be working is I should be able to rotate my hand both to the left and to the right to open the door, but it isn't behaving that way because I clearly messed up some of the math. Anyway, other cool key things. Uh, as you can see, as we insert the key in and turn it like so, we can see that the deadbolt handle actually turns. So these actually are able to share control over uh, this bolt, which was harder to figure out uh, than it uh, might seem like it would be. Uh, other cool things about this, don't don't go away door, stay, stay, there we go, is that if you have the incorrect key, this doesn't use uh, our tin octagonal key, it uses our brass round, the key will partially insert, but then it will stop, and you actually hear a little sound. I'm sort of imagining, I know in certain cases, if you had the wrong key, it would go all the way into the lock if they had the same uh, cross section, uh, but I wanted just for better communication that you're using the incorrect key to actually, uh, yeah, do that. And as you can see, as I'm pulling this in and out, this is actually completely deleting and reinstantiating an object. And so, yeah, it took a little bit of effort to get that transition as smooth as it is, but it is working well. Still don't have door slamming working correctly. Need to fix that. Cool. So that is our key shenanigans. Let's get on to some explosive shenanigans. <sighs> Where to start? So uh, I didn't show uh, any sort of explosions in relationship to the doors last week because explosive damage wasn't working correctly. And that's because 
the door and then the shards of the door are separate objects. So say of the way it worked before is say an explosion blew up the door, that door would be disabled, its shards would be enabled, and then because the explosion had already happened, they didn't receive any damage. So I had to build essentially a, a, uh, a pass-through system specific to, uh, well, it'll work actually on all my shatterable props if I want it to, that actually sort of passes that damage on uh, from object to children. So let's try this out. Let's aim uh, roughly for the deadbolt. With our new, uh, I restored, I realized I had completely bugged out. The Swag 12 shells, they were missing their uh, super small radius explosion. That is back now. <laughs> So that didn't seem to blow that out. Interesting. So that time it didn't, it just shattered it. Let's see if we can hit a little bit higher. This is probably a radius issue. There we go. The actual strike point was closer to the, uh, the center point of that object. It's still something I need to tune, find an efficient way to tune the, uh, the math for. Um, basically, to keep explosions cheap, I'm only measuring distance to the center point of an object. So in this case, because the first explosive hit hit here, it essentially measured the explosive damage for damaging this piece and detaching its joint from here to the center point, whereas in this case, I actually aimed closer to the center point, which blew that piece off. Much better. Ah, oh, it's satisfying. Ha <laughs> ha! Love those impact sounds. So clearly some things still need some improvement. I'm still trying to find, uh, away it's it's a little annoying to get an actual rotated bounds volume cheaply to do the uh the distance comparison uh but who knows another week we'll see what happens if we move on over to our pinned grenades these have a bit wider of an explosive radius so this should give us a uh, a more satisfying and reliable result hopefully <laughs> Let's see if I can do this in a way that it doesn't just bounce uh, somewhere inconvenient. Oh, perfect. Okay, looks like that time we just got... Ooh, are this... Are you detached? Yep. At least one piece got detached, but it doesn't look like any of the others did. As I said, still trying to figure out good thresholds for these things. Because what I don't want is I don't want to have a grenade detonate in front of a door and have all of its shards uniformly blast back. That isn't interesting visually to me, especially for an explosive of this size. I want some of the door to still be like hanging there and attached. But obviously in this case, it might be a little bit too weak. Yep, looks like we still mainly just got a shatter. Oh, no, no. Yep, that one fell off, and that seems about it. Let's see if we can try a more powerful grenade and see if that does. This one, this one's decent, but we've got a couple that are, uh, ooh, we'll try a, we'll try a spam in a bit. Uh, oh, interesting. It looks like the explosive blew out that part of the frame, too. Set the time on this back down to two. And blew myself up. And blew out the doors. Okay, so that one was powerful enough that it looks like what happened is it blew a couple pieces off and it blew out the two hinges uh, while that assemblage is still uh, together. Interesting. Cool. Let's reload our scene again. We take something like our RPG-7. Hopefully we're standing far enough back. Let's see if this gives us some more interesting behavior. It was earlier in testing, but I'm showing it to you now, which means of course it's gonna break. There we go. So we get a door crack and it completely blows out the piece that got hit and a couple more of them while still leaving some of the door hanging. See, that's the result I'm trying to get more reliably with some of the other explosions. I think I just have to tune the constants that are on the shard pieces. 
Oh, that's perfect. That was a perfect shatter blowout. That's what I'm talking about. It'll always be a little unreliable. Let's go bottom corner. Wonderful. Ah, oh, perfect. See, this this is this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm hoping happens more frequently. And of course, the last explosive toy we'll play with with the doors for now is our spam. I know, I saw the hundreds of comments that were left about asking for breaching charges of some kind, and I'm gonna figure out something fun uh, that is a law that sort of like fits uh, with the sort of stylization uh, and uh, fun acronyms as the spam here. Uh, but until then, let's just see what happens when you grab one of these and just toss it down like so and detonate it. Oh wait, <laughs> it's been long enough that I forgot that you have to, boop, turn the safety off on that. Fun times. Oh, that was a little disappointing. That could have been better. I'll have to check the explosive values on that because that, yeah, that only took out, it only cleared the joint on one piece. Let's try one more. Maybe we can, if we double dip it, that should definitely do it. Ha ha! And it uh, somehow set off that shotgun round, which was a little surprising. Ha! Ah, wonderful. Well, good to know that two of these get the, uh, get the job done in a thorough fashion. Ha! Ah. Do, 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 do. <sighs> ah, killed myself again. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yo, so the other big thing that I have been working on this week, despite the fact that it is exhausting, is I am finally, I've finally gotten some real creative inertia on the Winter Wasteland take and hold level. So I thought I would give you a little bit of a peek uh, of it and show you sort of like what is being worked on in terms of the redesign of it and adaptation for that mode and basically a little bit of what goes into working on something like this. So let's pop on over to the Unity editor. So here is our Winter Wasteland level and you may note with it like what are all these circles these are basically just notes to myself for where planned hold areas and supply points are going to be in it i'm going to turn off the fog <laughs> momentarily in the atmospherics so that you can get a better notion of that spread yes that is a lot of supply points uh and hold points you might be like how on earth is that going to work? Are you going to have to like go a kilometer every time? And no, you won't. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, this take and hold is already designed with what are called a whole, but uh, basically a, a bunch of pre-designed hold sequences um, that each have a seed associated with them. You can in the menu for take and hold, you can click one of the numbers to pick a specific seed. Uh, this level will be no different, and what that will allow me to do is to actually do a, uh, let's see here, snipping tool, uh, will allow me to do something where I can design a, a hold sequence that might take you, say, always starting on this one, and then sort of coming over here, and then possibly over here, and then back to here, and then hold five over there. And that's what one of the sequences might be. So yeah, uh, so let's take a look at uh, some of the changes. So one, obviously the way the Winter of Wasteland worked as a mode was that it was designed to be a very sort of unidirectional experience. There was a defined starting point. There was a designed sort of sequence of all of the bunkers. I was trying to funnel you in a specific direction and make the sort of discovery and climbing challenges be you uh, sort of assume that you were coming from a specific direction. That isn't the case here for take and hold. And so for that reason, uh, a whole bunch of areas uh, essentially have way more access up to them. So even say this plinth here now has a ramp here and a ramp here. Uh, it can't just be accessed via bridges. Um, this area, this sort of uh, 
yeah, elevation change here actually has ramp access here. A lot of plinths that you couldn't get up to before uh, with smooth locomotion, uh, you can. Uh, you can now sort of ramp up to there. Uh, another example is say, yeah, so say this one here still has the ladder that was in the level, but there is a route that comes up here and a route that comes up here. We can actually see a lot of that clearer if I turn on the nav mesh. And this is, of course, necessary both to just make it more convenient and interesting to be able to navigate playing take and hold. It means that when you actually look at your radar and see, oh, a hold point is that way, there's going to be a way more direct route to that hold point typically uh, than in the original level. If we actually look at, say, one of our hold points like this one here, I believe this is, is this two, three? Oh, come on. Do I just not have my move manipulator on? There we go. Okay, cool. Hold two. Had center on. If we look at sort of what makes a hold point, we can see that we've got a series of navigation blockers uh, along with their, their colliders. So that will actually be the hold once you're in it. Let's go ahead and turn on our fancy lighting so we can get a better idea of how that looks. And all of these little gizmos that you see here are part of the definition of where various things can spawn. We've got the node that you actually run up to and pop with your hand. We've got all of the positions that defenders might be standing. Um, let's see which color is that. That's the light blue there. Um, and then we have uh, attack vectors. So if I, I'm going to turn off the other hold points momentarily so that these are easier to see. So you can see that there's, say, a cluster of spawn points here for a given attack vector. And I can, when I'm planning this out and seeing where these go, I've got this little path tester that I can lay down and sort of place that there and then place a destination cube, say, to there. And then click this and get a test path. And so that's going to, that's showing me how the path from the nav mesh is going to be generated in terms of where they're going. And obviously they don't path to the node, they path to another set of points, which are just called turret because I had originally planned to have turrets as a core part of Take and Hold, um, but a lot of people really don't enjoy the turrets. Uh, but I ended up using those points because they were useful as effectively the initial destination when the SOSIGs are charging in in Take and Hold. And so this basically helps ensure that, it's, say, if you're hiding pretty far away from the node, uh, that it's statistically likely that one of the incoming SOSIGs is going to path near you and see you. So there you have that. So that's basically what uh, comprises a hold point. Uh, I have a lot more work to do on this. As I said, there's, there's gonna be 37 hold points in this and about 45 supply points. So it's a lot to, uh, to get right, but it's a, it's a fun compositional challenge. And you know, it's, it's wonderful to sort of revisit this level uh, because there's a lot of areas that I had sort of imagined as I was laying out the initial terrain as being interesting places for fights to occur, but just due to the design of the winter wasteland and where patrols ended up spawning and where they ended up getting aggroed, fights didn't end up really happening in a lot of places that I was interested, especially in the first half of the level where the intensity is way lower. So this ends up being an opportunity for, uh, for me to end up uh, having that happen. So let's turn on the other hold points we have so far. Yep, so we've got one here that's a sort of a little bit of a base with three entrances. Not all of them will be structures. So some of them are just gonna be interesting topological features. This one here, I uh, this uh, this one, I think you're going to end up uh, lo loving to hate this one is uh, ends up being a uh, sort of juggling two directions here up and down this piece of ground, which you'll end up probably using as makeshift cover a whole lot. And if we take a look at where it's attack vectors. So basically each, each hold point has five attack vectors, but for a given wave at most, three of them will be used total. So, so in the case of this, we've got a spawn group over here. 
We've got a spawn group back here. We've got a spawn group around back here. This is the close aspect one. They arrive very quickly. We've got one same sort of eventual approach angle, but obviously coming from a greater distance. So if you're perched here, you're going to have a longer range engagement. And then a set here, all the way over here in this base. And then in terms of the supply points, it's something I'm still working working out. But basically the supply points are, you'll notice I, I haven't mentioned the bunkers at all. And part of this relates to pathing complexity and part of it relates to the fact that all the bunkers looked the same um, because they're produced very rapidly. But also just, I think there's, there's, there's enough indoor taken hold at this point uh, with the default level that I decided, I stripped all of the bunkers out uh, for this version of the level. All the supply points will be outside. It will mean in certain circumstances, you will be more vulnerable. Just chilling out at a supply point is not going to be a super safe thing unless topologically that specific supply point is. So it's going to be one of those things that you're going to have to evaluate as you're coming into the supply point after you've cleared it, how much time you can spend. And if there is an active hold or uh, appears to have uh, active patrols in the area uh, that could be a threat. There you can see all the gizmos for it. Defensive points, screens, boxes, table, stuff. So yeah, and then the last thing I'm sort of figuring out with this level is the patrol logic that was coded obviously for a indoor level that is fairly close aspect isn't really ideal for a level of this scale. That is, if I were to apply the current patrol logic to this, there would be a lot of patrols being spawned that you would just never encounter. They would spawn on completely incorrect parts of the level 600 meters away, you never run into them. And so I'm in the process of coding a, uh, a completely different uh, sort of set of logics uh, for outdoor levels that still use the embedded data set of the map, just uses it differently, which does mean that for any of you out there who make custom take and hold levels, you will be able to, with a simple bool value, use the alternate patrol logic if it works better for your map and you're interested in it. So yeah. Hopefully that all ends up working well. So yes, that just about does it for this week. No update or alpha this week. As I said, I, I, I got really into working on this level and I'm going to actually spend the whole rest of the day doing it because uh, those 37 hold points aren't going to lay themselves out. And as I said, I, I finally, I've been sort of dragging my heels on this level, getting little bits of work done here and there, playing with the light mapping, playing with parts of the layout because it just wasn't, I didn't really have an intuitive design logic going for how I wanted to pro approach the volume of content that making a space this big for take and hold uh, requires. Um, but especially after putting in that, that, that wall tile kit I found and modified, I'm really feeling good about the level and I feel as though I have a set of heuristics as a designer that I can apply to make those hold points interesting and to make them varied in interesting ways about being like purely close aspect, close aspect, but with one engagement direction being really long, uh, being completely surrounded, being more boxed into a corner, etc. So I now feel like I've got a set of variables I can control and vary between the holds to make it so that it's a dynamic and interesting sequence, regardless of what part of the map you're on. Um, and content wise, by the time this is done, it's, it's so big and the, the sequences will, the hold sequences will be different enough that in many ways, it's sort of like adding three to four levels worth of content. So, uh, it'll all be worth it in the end. So, well, with that, I hope you all have yourselves a wonderful weekend and I'll, uh, see you all next week. Peace.